All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching this panel today. We have a bunch of experts on the topic of SBOMs or Software Bill of Materials. Uh, let's start with everyone introducing themselves. Alan, do you want to go first? <laughs> I was going to say, are we going to jump on all at once and then try to squ squeeze the doorway? Um, I'm Alan Friedman. Uh, I'm sometimes referred to as the guy who doesn't shut up about SBOM. Uh, failed academic who got talked into joining government about six years ago. Uh, and helped coordinate the international uh, uh, cross-sector effort at NTIA that sort of created a, a shared vision of SBOM, recently moved over to CISA to help scale and operationalize that while still making sure that SBOM remains a community-led effort. Awesome. Nisha? Yeah, uh, I also failed. Uh, I failed a long time ago at manufacturing. Uh, I used to be an RF engineer. But now I do uh, devops -y stuff uh, concerned with the uh, container images at the Open Source Technology Center at VMware. Um, my focus is, well, it started off in the compliance space. And you will, uh, if you, you know, squint a little bit, you'll find that a lot of concerns about compliance and security overlap. One of the places that they do overlap is the S bomb. Uh, so I uh, originated and uh, now I'm a co maintainer of Turn, which is uh, a tool that uh, generates S bombs for container images. Uh, what I am aiming to do is try and integrate S bombs in the container build and distribution uh, ecosystem. And uh, I have talks accepted around that space uh, that's uh, at KubeCon later. So there you go. And Frederick? So, yeah, hello, I'm Frederick. So I uh, focus on quite a few areas in the in the open source community. Uh, I have prior experience working on storage and networking and containers. Uh, I spend a significant portion of my time focusing on where container networking uh, and telecommunications met. I still work with those particular groups on an ongoing basis as well to help define what's called the cloud native network function. I also work in the zero trust space quite extensively in around these time periods where I help uh, multiple groups and multiple companies try to work out what a zero trust strategy would look like that is rooted on open source technologies where much of it is available through Linux Foundation or Cloud Native Computing Foundations. Uh, some of those efforts also include, I'm on the Technical Advisory Committee for the Linux Foundation Public Health, and I'm also on the Technical Steering Committee for the SPIFI project, which is an open source standard for how to deliver cryptographic identities to workloads so that they can then use that to gain access to other things without using secrets. Awesome. You said both of the magic buzzwords, zero trust and S-bombs. <laughs> of everything in the last uh, executive order. Um, all right. Well, I'll introduce myself quickly as well. Uh, I am moderating the event this is going to be shown at. So if you're watching this live, you probably already heard this. If you're watching this later, uh, my name is Dan Lawrence. I'm an engineer, and I work on a lot of container cloud uh, software supply chain security related things, which is how I got roped into coordinating this conference um, and SBOMs in particular. So let's uh, let's jump in here. Um, SBOMs get compared to a lot of different things. Uh, what are your, your favorite and least favorite metaphors for SBOMs? Let's let's let Alan start with that one. We've all heard the nutrition label. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to reach off screen here and uh, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, at KubeCon, uh, I will uh, a new Twinkie drink, so I can sort of have something other than the Twinkies to hold up with. And I, right, I think it's it's a natural uh, approach, which is the list of ingredients is imperfect, but there's sort of a very real question, which is, hey, would you buy or use or consume something where they couldn't produce this? Right? If someone said, "Ah, oh, Twinkie, it's got stuff in it." And we know that it has stuff in it, but we sort of hope that someone somewhere is actually keeping a careful track of it. And that's really a big part of it. And the other analogy I like uh, is, uh, and this is perhaps a, a little bit uh, ambitious to think about given the role that it plays, is, is CVE or the, a vulnerability identifier. 
which is to say there's nothing magical about uh, a CVE, right? Having a vulnerability on CVE doesn't mean it's fixed. You still have to do the work to secure your network and secure your software. But by creating this common framework and set of practices around it and institutions around it, uh, it has helped build a very effective and occasionally efficient uh, ecosystem that allows us to make progress. And so it's sort of one of these necessary data layers on which we're going to build a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. So I, also... I have. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, you, you, you first, please. Uh, uh, so an analogy that I've been using a lot uh, with regards to container images is a sandwich. And um, the way that I would talk about, uh, you know, it, what SBOM brings to the table is the difference between a Subway sandwich and, you know, no no sh uh, shade on Subway, but would you rather, uh, what What do you think is the difference in quality between the Subway sandwich and a sandwich that was uh, created by a farm to table restaurant? Um, the farm to tra table restaurant probably has the higher quality sandwich because they uh, actually know where all the ingredients come from and they have working relationships with the communities that make those ingredients. So that's uh, because, you know, container images look like sandwiches. That's usually the, the analogy I use. I thought we were going to go somewhere with like sandwiches versus burritos where you can see the insides of one but not the other or something, sticking with the Twinkie theme. But I like the, I like the farm to table one too. <laughs> I have me? used I have used uh, you know uh, container images like uh, sandwich versus versus smoothie versus parfait versus uh, weird uh, Asian candy. I, I'm looking forward to the first marketing campaign that ar that advertises artisanal s bombs, <laughs> handcrafted. <laughs> no, you're doing it wrong. We'll come to that one later. <laughs> Uh, Frederick? <laughs> yeah, so I I don't really have any good analogies in this space, uh, but I, tr I do try to bring things down to like, what are the core principles that people want to want to have? Part of it is when we talk about, well, where did it come from? What's the quality of it? And it all comes, I think it all comes down to to things like trust, like should I trust this thing? How long should I trust it for? And for what period of time? Are there any conditions where I should stop trusting it? And the way that we have things today, uh, we're trying to improve on on that level of, of trust to say, so that we can reason about it and not just the human reason, reasoning about it, but to be able to automate that that reasoning, to automate much of that trust trust process. So uh, at the end of the day, we have all these technological measures, but it, it, all, it always comes down to why should I trust this thing? Makes sense. So one of the first topics I wanted to kind of talk through here is why now, right? It's 2021, um, supply chain attacks are all over the news. Um, we've had food ingredient labels forever. Right? We've had uh, software for a long, long time. Why now? Why is now the right time to do this? Why is why are all of these attacks happening this year? Any guesses? Well, um, oh, I, I was going to say, like, you know, I think um, there have been folks that have been focused on trying to uh, maintain software hygiene for a very long time. Um, it just so happens that people really didn't see a need for it because at the time supply chain attacks were not really happening. Um, but the now that we have some that are very high profile and everybody knows about it and I heard it on the marketplace morning report many times now. Uh, this is now top of mind, and everyone's looking for a solution, like right now, like yesterday. <laughs> and I think you know there there are a couple of reasons. Um, one is in a rare note of optimism, we've gotten slightly better at software security, and so that a determined adversary that actually wants to make some progress actually can't go and attack the front gate. They've got to sort of sneak in 
uh, and, and find a way to go upstream. And that, of course, expands the attack surface. The other thing to acknowledge is, of course, people have been talking about SBOM for a long time. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're champions out in the world, uh, folks like, you know, Josh Corbin and the Calvary that have been talking about this. And in fact, there was even an attempt to put this in legislation back in 2014. Uh, and part of the challenge, if you sort of want to understand the process to change, is to understand why that didn't succeed. Part of it was, uh, you know, and Frederick and Nisha know a lot more about this than I do. Um, people weren't always great about tracking their open source obligations and licensing. Uh, and in fact, that's the origin of, of one of the two big FBOM standards is to track the licensing. But I think there's sort of this confluence of events of people saying, okay, we know we're gonna have to do something and this is something, so let's move forward. And then the high profile supply chain tax have given both industry push. And of course, your friends in the US government have said, you know, hey, what can we do to really drive uh, behavior and investment changes? Yeah, and and I think a lot of it comes down to economics as well. Like, if you're a determined attacker, uh, you want to get an effect, whether that effect is to increase your bank account or to exfiltrate some information as part of a advanced persistent threat, then you have limited resources. Even if you have a lot of resources, it's still limited. So you have to look at where can I apply these resources? And uh, to Alan's point, we've gotten much more savvy at certain at defending against certain types of attacks because we see them very often. And the supply chain is one of those areas where if you want to attack a hard and target, you don't attack it directly. You try to find the the supplier, attack the supplier, and then indirectly gain access to the to the bigger target. There's also a couple other advantages as well. Like we focus heavily on, well, how do we defend against the uh, the company, our suppliers from being broken into, but also take into consideration that it's not just it's not just whether they're broken into. You could have something where the supplier is never breached, but you still don't you don't have visibility into. Oh, I'm running a version of some XML parser that is that is at risk. It was statically compiled in. My image scanner won't pick it up. I don't even know it's there, and then suddenly I'm breached. And so the so, so supply chain is not just about defending a, against a supplier that's breached. It's also about knowing what's in your infrastructure. And, and one of the other advantages, uh, as Frederick mentioned, on the on the market side of things, is as we think about software creation and delivery, not as sort of a single actor, but as sort of a supply chain that we're moving down. Um, SBOM is, has the advantage of being discrete and measurable. Right? Uh, you have one or you don't. And of course, there's many shades of nuance beyond that. But uh, one of the things this can get us is it, it allows us to say, here's some progress that you can tangibly make that you can ask for your supplier that doesn't say, oh, you need to go through a seven-year process audit uh, to show that you have that you've been reading from the DevSecOps Bible and you've, you've implemented it in your soul. It's, an SBOM is a nice discrete thing that is, in the economics terms, it's an efficient signal. Uh, if you have a good process, building an SBOM is cheap. If you don't, it's gonna be more expensive. Uh, and so this is, it allows us to sort of help reward organizations uh, that are developing good software with good processes. So one thing I do want to uh, highlight is the uh, confusion between an SBOM and a package manifest. So most uh, developers confuse the two because they think that a package manifest indicates what's in the software, and that's not true. That's just some information to the package manager to say, uh, these are all the things that this particular component depends on, and I will just pull all of those things. And usually package managers will say, well, the, all of these, each of these components have like other dependencies and they'll pull those. So transitive dependencies are not usually visible in the package manifest. For that, you need an actual, uh, like a full SBOM because you don't know whether the transitive dependencies that you're pulling are vulnerable or not. Uh, and, and builds are weird things that most people like really do not have any visibility into. Uh, so this is, this I think is like a, some place where developers say, wait a minute, I do have an SBOM. It's right there in the package.json. Um, and then there has to be like some education 
involved in there. So uh, it's yeah, uh, part of our uh, part of our growth over here is to actually understand like why the things that we have right now do not meet the requirements that we want. Cool. Yeah, so this is KubeCon, Cloud Native Con. Uh, everybody here is focused on containers, Kubernetes-y things. And Kubernetes, um, so we're recording this in September. Uh, Kubernetes a few months ago just shipped their latest release with SBOMs for the very first time. There's a bunch of work that went into making a new SBOM creator for the Kubernetes infrastructure. Um, do people here see kind of challenges uh, with shipping SBOMs for container native, uh, cloud native -y things? Is it easier? Is it harder? Um, how does it compare to some of the other industries looking at adopting SBOMs today? So I'll, I'll so, chime in since I am not ahead. a native of the cloud. I'm going to give some of the sort of the the contrast about what we need to sort of think about, and then I'll let the people who actually build things uh, chime in on, on what we're doing. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that a lot of the impetus behind software transparency started uh, at the other end of the software world. It was around uh, ship software, it was around embedded devices, it was around legacy tech, it was around safety critical world where it's actually really important to know, hey, since you know my rare industrial control system may not have a vulnerability in itself that's easily scanned for, uh, I have to care about what's under the hood. Um, now, another big part of it is the, it's assumed that the asset owner or the hospital or whoever is that's using the software uh, on-prem is empowered to take some action, right? That uh, once I know what the SBOM is, I can, if that patch isn't available, I can tune my IDS, I can uh, segment my network, I can work with my thread until like, there's a lot of security options there from the customer side. And so we talk a lot about a lot of the benefits from the user side. Uh, in a cloud or SaaS world, some of the underlying mechanics are a little different. Uh, and this is something that I think the community still needs to explore is to sort of actually nail down what are the broader ecosystem-wide use cases across the supply chain. But I also think that there's a huge advantage in the cloud native world in that uh, there's the, the tools of DevOps allow us to sort of say, um, we're, we're already a little more aware of the importance of knowing what's in our, our you know, ongoing build process. And so I think that's enabled uh, much faster adoption and people sort of getting the value. And hopefully you all out there do too. One thing I do uh, notice is that in the cloud native world, software reuse is really high, much higher than what uh, folks have anticipated for software usually uh, it used to be like a small piece of, uh, you know, code that we shared via USB stick. And now it is like everyone has their like own open source project hosted on GitHub and it's free. Everyone can use it. And oh, that's that's wonderful because that means that there's a diversity of um, innovation that comes with um, having uh, open source projects and open code like this. But the downside is that there is also like uh, the, the dependency chain is really complicated for uh, uh, cloud native stuff, like hundreds and hundreds of software components uh, associated with one container image. Um, and it, it's, it just breaks your brain. So abstractions become really useful to continue to develop, but the abstractions hide away all of those little software components that um, end up breaking your brain. So the, the challenge with cloud native is actually trying to organize the s bonds in such a way that they are easily accessible when they're needed and not like all the time. I think part of the challenge that we're running into as well, it's like when we were doing really early versions of Docker, 2013, 2014, the applications were generally simple. We we explicitly ruled out things like, you know, people were gonna run 
things that look like Hadoop or Erlang OTP, which have very specific networking properties. Uh, the idea was let's go and try to run something that focuses on small microservices that uh, that you would run within some platform as a service similar to Heroku or or similar. Part of the because of that very narrow focus early on, which I I don't think was the wrong thing. It helped us succeed, but the threat model was not as extensive as we should have made it. Like we were looking at how do we prevent container breakout? How do we pre, how do we protect the network and how do we protect the the Docker socket so that people can't send random commands to Docker? Uh, so the threat model did not include things like well, what if my image was modified? find underneath? Would we notice? And it turns out that was an incredibly important question. And I know for sure that we didn't ask those questions because like uh, Docker, Docker save and Docker load is like, I, I wrote those. And so I was heavily involved in the creation of, of some of these things. It was the first format that uh, that was on that was on disk for an image outside of the Docker push to a, to a repo somewhere. And there's, and there's mistakes that we, if we had expanded our threat model at the time, the, these type of mistakes, many of them, not saying that they wouldn't be here, but like there's there's a whole set of thing around image signing and like where do the hashes come from? Like the the Docker image hashes historically were just randomly generated. They didn't mean anything other than it's just a random number. And so there's a lot of mistakes that were made in the past that are uh, that that we're paying for today because of that hyper focused. And like I was saying, it's it was a trade off. Like people, they were the, the teams were focused primarily on things that were re that they that were relevant at the time. And it, it was hard to predict that we'd get to the type of success that we see here today. Like we knew it was going to be big, but not this big, and and this important. So we're we're now at a point where. We have very complex pieces of software. Like some of the the amount that, that it takes to build some of these software, I would not be surprised if they were more expensive in terms of in, in terms of resources than uh, building a cruise ship. Like how much how much goes into building Kubernetes itself? It's the second largest developer community in the world in the open source space. So you just look at the total number of resources. Where we're at a we're at a point where we have to fix things now because if we don't fix them, the the software is just going to get more complex. The attack services are not going to are are not going to get any better without significant work. And so this this marks an important aspect of of reducing the total cost of defending the the system. Are you saying that we shouldn't be moving fast and breaking things then? <laughs> we well we we should move fast and we should break things, but we should be mindful of what we have broken. He brought back all these memories of Docker in 2014, and that uh, the the subway sandwich metaphor is perfect because you wouldn't eat a sandwich <laughs> from 2014 either. It software software expires too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible joke. Oh. No, I like right. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so let's say uh, somebody does want to start uh, producing S bombs. Um, they're cloud native. Uh, they want to start producing S bombs for their applications. Um, have you seen people kind of make this transition and start with the journey? Are there some tips you have? Things people should avoid, should watch out for. What are the right ways to do it? It's it's actually really easy to generate an S bomb right now. There are so many tools that can help you with it. Um, in fact. Um, Linux Foundation's Automated Compliance Tooling Group has a list of tools that you can use right now to generate an s uh, What folks usually get upset about is that the s is typically very big. And this is not surprising because that's how many components you have in your deployment. So naturally, it'll be really big. Uh, the other thing to note that it's also big because of the amount of metadata that is present in the s -bomb. You need all of that metadata uh, when you want to analyze your supply chain, and that's why it's there. Um, so even though it can look very scary in the beginning, all it is is just a giant list. Um, we still do not have tools 
that would take in the giant list and filter it out to get you, you know, the whether you have the these list of denied things in the S bomb or whether it is it is an expired S bomb. All of those analytic tools don't exist right now, uh, mostly because the way folks have historically looked at this is. Uh, point a static analyzer at this set of files, and the static analyzer will crunch all the data for you. So um, S bonds have never really come into that picture before, and what we're trying to do is um, hopefully make sure that we have tools that work on this, work on these S bonds, and analyze it and generate the you know valuable information that folks need. I, I agree with Nisha. I think um, the basics of pulling this together today are 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 there. Um, there's uh, I love Cyclone DX as well as SPDX. I love them both equally, uh, and there are both of the communities have done a good job of of curating uh, their their tooling ecosystem again for both uh, open source tools as well as commercial tools for folks who want to integrate them. We're seeing more and more things integrated into the existing build tools. Um, and you know, in, in this world, uh, you may want to sort of say, hey, what's the SBOM of my repo, of my source? But really, we want to sort of move people to think about creating the SBOM at build. Uh, we all know that um, right, there's some dark arts in, in build tools and compilers. And uh, so you're, you're really only yet to get to the ground truth of what's in your software uh, from the moment your software is actually built. Where we're still learning is some of the glue that puts the different parts of the build chain together. And this has actually been great to sort of see people say on Twitter, oh, well, how do I, how do I plug this into this? And so it's, oh, that's a good question. And then a few days later, hey, I solved your problem. Check out this, you know, and so there, there's a great opportunity for people to actually come up with new things. Um, and the last thing I'll say uh, on one of the things that's, that's still known hard is software identity is an entity resolution is actually still a tricky issue, um, especially if you're in a um, slightly less well-trodden corner of the software ecosystem, if package managers are still sort of a rough hewn uh, log cabin tech for your corner of software, um, then the challenge of an S, or the, the goal of an SBOM is when you tell me what your software is, I should be able to know what that software is. Uh, and in well-defined areas, that's super easy, right? We have well-defined namespaces, uh, but we don't always have that. And that's some of the things that we're going to have to think about moving forward is how do we make sure that we can actually map to the stuff we care about? We can map to the vulnerability databases. We can map to the license databases, things like that. You're telling okay. us that naming is hard? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say in the history of IT, we've successfully built a truly globally resilient distributed namespace exactly once. And the annual budget of ICANN is about $100 million. So, you know, we're going to need some help if we want to get to that level. I'm sure they couldn't name all the software they used to operate that. Yeah, and I think uh, one thing to really highlight is uh, what Alan mentions explicitly with compilers. Like, we look at what the inputs are on a given system and we say these inputs led to some to some output and by inputs we don't necessarily mean like this is uh file.c like you actually have to go drive down into the contents and one of the examples i tend to use is uh if i had something that was called exploit.exe and i rename it to principal.exe uh, is it uh, is it still the same file is it still the same thing just with a different name so names are actually metadata but when you start looking at the compiler, the compiler represents an action or something that perform, performs transformation. And you also have to know, was the compiler in in good shape? Was it modified in, in some way? So you have to look at the environment that, that is there. And you also have to look at the process. And the SBOM does not necessarily tell you what was the process that this thing took in order to become that thing. So there's a variety of, of additional things we're eventually going to have to look at. The SBOM represents the first major turn of the crank, and it's a huge crank. So like, don't get me wrong on that. It's super important. But it's not the only thing that we don't want to stop at SBOM. We want to take a look at how do we drive this towards so we can actually look at the contents and say this particular section of code, like here's a here's a thought experiment. How many 
how many people uh, in the industry have copied from Stack Overflow and pasted that into their into their source code somewhere, and then that's now shipping in critical infrastructure? What if now let's talk about supply chain attacks? What if you had somebody who modified or added something that had a very nuanced bug in there? And now you need to go and update that bug everywhere it's been used. Impossible task today. And so we, if we can get down to the content and get down to the fingerprinting of that of that information, then it'll still be a difficult task. But we at least have a chance of, of finding some of these things. Saying like this snippet of code led to these CVEs. We're also running that snippet of code. And so we, we eventually need to to find more savvy ways to do that. But that's way down the line. Like just step one, we have to learn how to to crawl before we walk. And crawling is what went into our build in the first place through through an SBOM. Um, both Alan and Frederick have touched upon a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is build systems. Um, one uh, thing about build systems is that actually a lot of like Linux distro suppliers have kind of got a handle on these issues before, and they're actually making some really good progress in trying to reduce uh, the build seed and um, make builds more reproducible and uh, changes with packaging and you know functional builds where the only thing uh, to the builds, the only thing that represents the builds are the inputs and the outputs and there are no side effects. So um, I think it would be awesome if the cloud native community took a look at what distro folks are doing nowadays. Uh, there are lots of folks that point to reproduciblebuilds.org, but there are many other distro tool suppliers that implement this in some ways, uh, you know, in, in many different ways. And we should actually, you know, take inspiration from them. Those are great points. And, and, and that ties into my last, oh, sorry, go ahead, Alan. Go ahead, we'll go no, go ahead. Last question. Oh, sure. I was going to say that ties, uh, the last question here, which I want to wrap up with. Um, if we have thousands of you know the most talented engineers in the world here at uh, NativeCon, KubeCon. If you could wave a magic wand and have them kind of you know change something about software completely, get creative here, like what to improve software supply chain security and S bombs forever. You know what? What would you change about the way we build software? Oh, I can go on, yeah. on this. I I, uh, I often call myself like a code mom because I'll <laughs> I'll tell uh, you know developers to clean their room. Uh, your mom doesn't uh, you know take care of your code. You take care of your code. Uh, it is your responsibility to know to understand what your dependencies are whether they're the right dependencies and you know what exactly are you installing on your uh, container that you're pretending is your desktop <laughs> and uh, uh, you know wh what versions of this uh, code are you using are you downloading uh, from somebody's <laughs> github gist or um, just some random euro that your friend gave you uh, yeah, be be careful when you code. Have some discipline. Uh, tough question. I think uh, part of what I would encourage is first, when you when you write software, always consider where this thing is going to to be run, and it's always a trade off because we we have to get features out, we have to ship, but at the same time, we also have to make sure that. Uh, that we're doing a good job with with what we're with what we're doing, and there's a wide variety of tools and techniques that can help you do this. That uh, that are available, and we're constantly improving and iterating on them as a as a community. Uh, but I I wish that people would be more. Uh, proactive on, on some of this stuff to, to help find where like what some of these processes and, and techniques are. And also that uh, like I, I found that people are more than willing to help. Like 
you just if you just hop onto Twitter literally and just say hashtag cloud native, I need help with this, and how would I how would I secure the system? Or you tag a couple of key people who are in that space, you'll get a lot of visibility, and you very likely get somebody to at least point you in the right direction. But it but it still feels very ad hoc, very bespoke type of communication. There's there's not really a, a group that says here's a set of patterns of cookie cutter things that I can apply now that work across. 80% of all projects that uh, that would help you set up that initial that initial framework, and so so I think that there's still a lot of more like we need to be careful we don't kill innovation, but there's there's also basics that apply in, in most scenarios. It would be fantastic for people to apply. So I, I love Frederick's point about where something will be used because there's such a huge difference in what we need from our software for you know a fun little web app that's going to help us better serve ads versus things that are in critical infrastructure we actually need a lot more um and the my one plea as i've sort of worked with um more and more folks in the cloud native world is sort of understanding the sheer diversity of the software community um and and there's a very long tail of folks that even if they have, and many of them do in fact have the technical chops to pick up something like in Toto, it's fundamentally useless for their environment today uh, because it's not how the organization builds software, it's not how they ship software. And so we need to sort of think about that world. Um, things that I'm looking forward to, and this is where I get to have a plug, whereas if you'd like to get involved in the technical side and in the policy side, um, the global SBOM community needs your help. Looking forward, as I mentioned, there's a lot we still haven't figured out around sort of the SaaS model in general, even before we get to the great cloud native work uh, that all of the KubeCon, KubeCon experts are using, um, which is, hey, um, tracking identity behind third-party APIs uh, or microservices or dynamically generated code. What does transparency look like in those domains? These aren't areas where we don't have any answers, but we're going to need to sort of find a way to talk about it in a way that's sort of tech neutral and scales. And the last thing I'm going to add uh, when I'm looking ahead to this is um, the more you, the more I'm in security, the more I realize that it's really the boring problems that are going to need the hardest work. And configuration management for me is sort of the next frontier uh, because we don't have scalable cross tech, cross sector ways of thinking about config management where users and deployers can actually sort of describe what they're doing in a way that folks who are in the compliance world or in the risk management world can actually understand and say, you've done it right. Uh, and you know, even just as simple as, hey, you remember when I sold you this thing and we said, don't plug it into the internet? You weren't an idiot, were you? Uh, right? We need a way to sort of manage that and measure that at scale. And so there's tons of work to be done. Awesome. Well, if you want to talk about config management, you came to the right conference. I'm sure <laughs> enjoy the next couple of days here at KubeCon.